ladies and gentlemen. Um, I might say that uh, this is Joe Minerick again, but I probably should say this is Joe Minerick still. Uh, I am the Senior Vice President and Director of Research at the Committee for Economic Development. Thank you for coming for the discussion of um, a really interesting paper about a really interesting subject. I think if we look at the uh, population of the United States at large, uh, financial indices uh, as a uh, topic, it's probably a topic uh, about which more is known than is actually understood. Uh, there's a lot to be learned in this area of, that is of great importance to many Americans. Uh, and so we've been very pleased to uh, be able to produce this paper in collaboration with uh, our speaker here, who is Simon Peck. He is Associate Profe Professor of Design and Innovation at the Weatherhead School of Management, Case Western University in Cleveland, Ohio. And Simon was kind enough to come and join us here to uh, discuss uh, this issue and the paper that he's written, which you have uh, in front of you. Um, Simon, uh, was educated in England at the universities of Leeds and Warwick. And Simon, I, please confirm, it's Warwick, not Warwick. Whenever we have an event here at CED, we always have one important life lesson for you to take home. It's the University of Warwick, okay? So everybody remember that. Uh, Simon, thank you very much. It's been uh, a pleasure working with you, and it's an outstanding paper, and uh, looking forward to your discussion. Yeah, uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for, for uh, coming this afternoon. It, it, uh, I ought to just give a shout out to a, to a few folks. I mean, I, uh, I don't claim to be an expert on the financial services industry or anything like that. Uh, you're going to meet uh, Rick Redding the CEO of the Index Industry Association shortly. I, and uh, Rick assembled a great team that I was able to collaborate with, uh, particularly uh, Brian Matthews at MSCI, Phil Galdi at uh, ICE, Peter Rothman at S&P Global, and Retta Gashami at FTSE Russell in London. Uh, so it was great connecting with these guys and learning about the industry. Uh, any errors, omissions remain, uh, remain my own after that. Um, I'm just gonna give you a, a quick sort of run through of, of what I think I did in the paper and, and, and some of the sort of talking points and then hopefully uh, you know, Rick will be back here to, 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 to flesh out some of the details. I think broadly speaking, we're all kind of comfortable with the idea of what, a, what an index is, and, and here is uh, Rick's association's formal definition of it. But we, we, we use these things all the time. Uh, inflation is based on the consumer price index. Uh, consumer confidence is based on our, our friends at the conference board's consumer confidence index measure. So we're, we're comfortable with the idea of using these as, as ways of talking about underlying phenomena. But there seem to be some sort of some, some, some key issues that, that pertain to all indices, and particularly financial indices. Uh, firstly, who's making the index? Who, who actually constructs, constructs the index? And, um, you know, I think in, in this industry, it's characterized by more firms than you would think. It's a pretty... Uh, there's a lot of companies doing this because, in reality, it's intellectual capital in one sense. Uh, the, it's about having ideas around index construction and then significant data capabilities around that. So you're, there are some specialist providers that, that maybe you've heard of, S&P, for instance, or, or Bloomberg, but then a whole bunch that, that you probably won't have heard of, much smaller shops. Um, the second issue then becomes for any index is, well, how are the assets uh, selected for inclusion in the index? What's the, what's the methodology by which assets actually get included into an index? In, in this industry, we see things, we see things around um, 
company size, for instance, market capitalization. It could be by geography, any, any sector of the world, or, or, or industrial sector. Um, so what is the, the, how are these assets, financial securities, chosen for inclusion? And then a, a third issue is around um, how are they weighted? How are, the, how are the, the entities within an index weighted? And the basis for this, as I suggest here, has traditionally been on size. So the larger your market capitalization or your debt issuance, the more weight you have within an index. Uh, Apple and Microsoft are the largest constituents, for instance, of the, the S&P 500. Uh, but that's not necessarily the only way. Uh, you can think about weighting by any other measure. And this gets us into the world of what I suggest in the paper is called smart beta, or thinking about weighting along factors not just related to, not just related to company size. So why does any of this matter, really? And, and I think it matters because we've seen you know, three important things going on. One is uh, the development of a whole new range of financial products developed around indexes. And so we've, we've seen you know, the development and the growth of mutual funds and uh, ETFs, exchange-traded funds, around the development of these indices. Secondly, these indices have become the way we monitor markets. We're now, uh, we now have a much better idea about the performance of funds within the market because we're able to benchmark them against a, a chosen index, for instance. And thirdly, this has become an area of, it's become one of the biggest areas of innovation in, in the financial services sector. The development of products around these things is the basis for future innovation. And so that's why how these, these issues that I think pertain to all indices matter particularly here. Let me, try and, let me try and just flesh out why I think some of these things do matter. So uh, AUM is just basically a, a shorthand for assets under management, the size of, uh, of the different markets. And I think what's important to show here is, uh, sorry, rather unhelpfully, I've two products that are based on indices are at the, the end, they're the orange and the yellow one. Um, and I think, you know, without, getting, without delving on the numbers too much, the orange and the yellow portions have grown. But also the, 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 the middle, the gray portion here, which is what we call the active fund management. So this is where mutual funds, where you, are, you effectively pay a, a, a manager to choose and select stocks for you and choose to win and when and had to, to purchase and sell those socks. It's still the largest sector here. The, the active fund management sector is still very much the largest, still control about two thirds to 70% of the total assets under management. But all the growth has been particularly in the, the orange products, these, this growth of exchange traded funds. And uh, we'll come to see what, what I think is the, is the uh, is the consequence of that. Here it is in sort of slightly more detail. Uh, the orange chart here is, is, shows particularly where uh, inflows and outflows out of these mutual funds, uh, exchange traded funds, and the actively managed sector. And the orange chart here is the, the actively managed sector. And so the orange bits below the line show that the actively managed mutual funds have, have hadn't experienced net outflows in the recent past. And it's probably not too hard of a link to make to say that most of that outflow from the actively managed sector has gone into funds that are, that are based on, on indices, on indices. So that, 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 that's, been, that's been driving a lot of the growth, as well as just the popularity of these products, the switch away from the, the actively managed sector towards the passively managed sector. Um, why? I mean, why would you do this? Uh, one reason is cost. Um, funds that are based on indices and a methodology based on indices are effectively about uh, replicating that recipe that's contained within the index methodology. And so there isn't a lot, there isn't decisions around what stocks to buy, when to buy them. You're effectively told 
what to do. You don't have to spend ex uh, any resources on doing research, for instance, and thinking about what is the right, right timing thing. And so consequently, uh, these products are cheaper. There's a whole bunch of, of expenditure that you're not, you're not incurring. And so the orange, the orange line here shows that you know, the expense ratio, the amount that is taken out of returns before you get them effectively, is about 60 to 70 basis points lower on average for funds that are based on indices rather than the actively managed sector. So cheaper passive funds um, you know, pass on the savings to investors effectively. But I think it is also, again, not unreasonable to suggest that the downward pressure on the more actively managed sector is probably because of the development of these of the index fund sector as well. So we've got a direct effect of actually switching out of <coughs> active funds into index funds, but then there's also an indirect effect as uh, you know, um, the actively managed sector is forced to get more efficient, is forced to cut its own, its own fees. Um, talking about the performance benchmarking uh, aspect, so the graph on the left is the number of U.S. mutual funds. And it's still, it's important to see that it still dominates the investing picture. There's still over 9,000 mutual funds out there. But the growth has been in the, in the expansion of exchange-traded funds particularly. Uh, and so that, that number is, has gone up significantly. And if, you, if I was to extend... The, the time series of mutual funds back, there have there only been a few periods where the number of, of mutual funds has actually decreased over time. And they're always associated with, uh, with stock market crashes. When the stock market crashes, the number of mutual funds decrease, except in the recent past. You know, the, that, that decrease in mutual funds in the recent past has not been associated with a decline in the stock market. So there's something else going on here. And I would suggest that something else going on is that because of the, the benchmarking role of index funds, just inefficient, actively managed mutual funds are effectively going away. Uh, they're, just being, they're just being competed out by, more, uh, by index funds themselves and by uh, actively managed funds that are delivering the returns. And it's interesting to say what delivering the returns is there. Uh, I'd like to say that the evidence is mixed on the ability of, of actively managed funds to beat the benchmark, but it's not really. It's actually pretty clear that, that because of the funds that the actively managed sectors have to choose, it's very, very difficult for, for the actively managed sector to really beat any given benchmark. So not only are these funds costing more, there's no evidence that even in the, the medium, short to medium run, that an actively managed fund can outperform a relevant benchmark. So there's a lot going on there, and I think that helps explain both the growth in, in ETFs and, uh, and this decline in, in inefficient or perce perceived to be inefficient, more mutual, uh, actively managed mutual funds. I'm being try, try, kind of clear to sort of say, I don't think, um, I'm trying to say that they're in constant competition. And in fact, what I call here is the sort of the value chain for the index, <laughs> index sector. And on the, the left-hand side of this little chart, it's the sort of sequence, if you like, of activities or the players involved at different stages of the value chain here. And uh, it's because it's important to realize that index funds don't do much price discovery. They actually need to have an actively managed sector out there doing price discovery, where individuals disagree, for instance, on the value of an asset and the timing of which it could be sold, in order to do price discovery, because index funds effectively just take prices. So the whole index fund sector does require an actively managed sector or some mechanism for doing price discovery. The, uh, moving two along, I mean, thinking about the, the index administrators or the creators and then the fund <coughs> managers, one of the issues that I, I think Rick will expand upon is, is this issue around, well, 
should they be separate or is it okay if they're the same people? Is it okay if the people creating the, the index are the same people actually managing the fund? Or is it better practice, better governance that the, the, the folks who create and manage the index are separate from the people that are actually managing the money? The Index Industry Association thinks that is better governance, but it's certainly not illegal to, to do self-indexing in, in any particular way. And then just finally on the right-hand side, you know, what about the companies that, that index funds and ETFs invest in? I, I know the CED has been very interested in the issue of short-termism, for instance, in, in uh, American uh, capitalism. And there's a thesis that suggests, you know, one of the causes of short-termism is the constant trading in and trading out of the actively managed financial sector. Well, if you believe that, in one sense, then index fund investing is the antidote to that because these are funds that never sell. Or in one sense, they do sell, but only if a company reduces its weighting or drops out of an index. Those are the only times you sell. You don't sell for poor performance whatsoever. So they're the ultimate sort of patient capital in one sense. They're, they're, they're there. And so the extent to which they are a, an antidote for short-term thinking, I think, is, a, is an interesting area. And, and they are realizing this. The, uh, the, the chief executive of BlackRock, uh, the largest fund manager, sort of uh, gave a very public statement saying, you know, we, we now hold lots of passively index-managed funds, but we're going to start flexing our muscle. We want to see certain things happen in this sector. So I think that, that's interesting. The markets for the products themselves is, is, is kind of concentrated. I would just sort of this is for, for uh, exchange traded funds here. And so we see the, the big players, uh, BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, Invesco, make up the bulk of the industry. But again, there is a significant 120 others that have the next 120 that make up a rather smaller portion of total assets under management here. So very big players, lots of smaller players as well. So let me just sort of wrap this up then by sort of trying to just highlight what I think some of the key findings are. It's, it's true that the, 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 the landscape has been transformed by, uh, by index investing. I, I guess I focused most of this talk on, on the equity side of the shop. But the report talks a little bit more about um, the fixed income or bond investing, which has also undergone similar, uh, similar large scale uh, transformation through, through the use of, of indices as well. The equivalent of the S&P 500 in the bond sector is called the AG, and uh, that has about 10,000 individual entities contained within the AG, and that's a very broad collection of the bond market. But it's true that it, it's completely transformed this. You know, just doing some, some, some rough calculations, you know, the savings to, to, to investors have been significant from the development of the industry. Um, just on, on the equity side, we're thinking around somewhere in the ballpark of about 40 to 50 billion a year. That's savings through switching out of the active fund sector, that's savings from not having transactions costs. And you know, that, 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 that's real money from, from just the change in, 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 uh, from the change in investment vehicle. Um, we think that the, the use of benchmarking has, you know, having real effects on the, the mutual fund industry, which, as I suggested, still dominates the, the investing scene in, in, in this country. But the extent that it's, it's used, it, it, it seems to be uh, at least partly responsible for why we see, you know, these, these changes. Um, I, I talk a bit in the report about, you know, the the issue of what I called smart beta there. And, and I, know, I know Rick will maybe say a bit more about it. He, he's not particularly fond of this idea of calling act, active and passive investing. And I think you know, the, the, the innovations in the index world means it, it, it's difficult to sort of say, well, yeah, this is, this is purely passive investing. It, it's rules-based, it's methodology-driven, whether that's purely uh, whether that's passive is another matter because we're seeing a lot of innovation here as as companies seek to sort of uh, 
increasingly what the financial industry has called its alpha effect, its sheer returns over and above the market, have been kind of competed away as you make that market benchmark more efficient. And then, you know, I, I speak a bit at the end of the report around the issue of regulation. And, um, you know, this is something that's a hot topic at the moment. Uh, as in the sort of the world of technology companies, the European Union has kind of taken the lead here and developed its uh, own benchmark regulation that uh, companies have to be fully compliant with uh, soon, actually. <laughs> And, and, you know, it, it, it's based on a set of principles that I think people can get a, on board with around accountability, transparency, and openness. And, um, but again, you know, we, we, we need to tread a little bit lightly when having, you know, a very uh, prescriptive regulatory policy because, you know, uh, unexpected things can happen. And, you know, as I've suggested, this is a very innovative industry. And you probably wouldn't want uh, regulation to, to, uh, to dull that innovatory edge of, of what's made this such an interesting sector to, to, to be in. So uh, that's a very brief tour of what I think I've, I've, I've tried to convey in the report. As I say, um, uh, uh, Rick Redding, the CEO of the, of the Index Industry Association, is going to be coming on the stage now and um, you know, we, we, we look forward to any sort of thoughts or observations uh, that, you, uh, that you may have. Thanks. Industry Association. Uh, he spent his career in the financial services industry uh, with much of the work you did before your current association really uh, involved in the evolution of the role of financial indexes in the uh, uh, development of the delivery of financial services, as Simon described a little bit. And what I'd like to do to start the discussion. Um, let me start with Simon, but uh, Rick, if you would, uh, would join in. Um, clearly, this is a subject that touches, this, this industry touches a large segment of the U.S. population. Those who are saving for retirement uh, are generally engaged to some degree in financial instruments that are related to uh, indexes in some way, shape, or form. At the very least, you're comparing your returns to those of indexes to determine how well you're doing. Um, given that this is really a much more, it's a much richer and a more complex subject than many people understand, uh, what do you think uh, the uh, public needs to know about this industry and uh, its role in the financial institutions. And Rick, if you could follow up on that and uh, help to explain a little bit about what the industry is trying to do to communicate with the public about those important questions. Yeah, I mean, I, I just when I was trying to motivate the report, I mean, there, there are plenty of surveys out there that, that suggest that we are as a nation sort of woefully underprepared for the provision of old age. And, and I, I think, you know, part of the answer is that we're, as we as individuals are, are asked to do more of that ourselves, we need to be able to invest in, in assets that deliver the kind of returns that are going to support, you know, uh, a standard of living in, in, in later life. And that means you need access to, to I think, 
financial markets and asset classes that maybe people hadn't thought of. And so I think one of the, one of the things that, that that has helped us do is the development of these funds is to kind of simplify it, to take away a lot of the uh, complexity around, um, you know, stock picking or bond picking and, and actually say, look, here are kind of relatively easy to understand products that, um, that don't actually cost very much and you can buy and sell them on your smartphone and, it, it, and you know, it, it's the accessibility. And I, I think that's, that's, really, that's really what these products, I think, have make them so attractive and, and, you know, fill a need here. They do, they do, they think they do fill, you know, potentially a void in, in a looming problem that we have. Yeah, and if I can follow up with that, uh, the numbers you came up with are significant in savings every year. Those are accruing to all of us that uh, invest or retirement funds are our investments. In. So we're picking up that money rather than the people that are in the, in the middle of that value chain uh, that Simon showed. So um, the one thing I would like to say is uh, along the innovation line that Simon was talking about is, you know, one of the th we do a survey every year of our members and our members um, calculate or administer about 3.7 million indices globally a, a year, which uh, if you ask 99.9% .9 of the people, including myself before we did the survey, couldn't come up with more than a handful of them. Um, why is that? And as Simon was saying is we're all, every one of us is involved in this industry whether you know it or not because of those 3.7 million indices, your investments are benchmarked to, some, to, to one of those benchmarks. And all of us, or a lot of us, are in, uh, involved in it because we are taking advantage of the cost savings, the transparency, and in those indexes. So I, I would contend that this, this really impacts everyone, or everyone that has a pension, um, but you don't think about it. Uh, it's not one of those things that uh, is going to worry you on the train this evening, and especially of all the things you can worry about in Washington, this is not one of them. That It's going to be in the top 100 on your list. So um, Simon's done, I think, an excellent job of pointing out a lot of the public policy issues here as well that, um, that all of us are going to have to deal with in our lives. I, I, sorry, I'm, I'm looking for an analogy. I mean, 3.7 million is, is a crazy number because, as you say, you can probably mean the Dow Jones, the S&P, the AG, you know, what's the others? And, and I guess the analogy, a lot of it is in the performance benchmarking side of it. And um, uh, I've got a nice um, set of Wusthof, Wusthof knives at home, nice knife, knife block. And um, there's like two or three of them I never use but they kind of complete the set, if you understand. And so I'm, I think there's a lot of that going on here, actually. You know, the, 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 you know the, the, there's so many combinations of, you know, the S&P minus, you know, alcoholic beverage companies or the S&P minus defense stocks, for instance, or something like that, that they complete the set. And that, then the number soon gets pretty large. But, um, and, and, you know, the, maybe they, they do have use somewhere, but it, 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 it's just part of that innovation I was talking about. Okay, so... Did that analogy work, by the way? Well, it's, <laughs> at some point we will discuss uh, exactly which knives those are that you don't use. But um, one of the questions that arises in my mind, when you think about that kind of mind-blowing number of financial indexes, is are we creating complexity that may not be necessary? Is it possible that... Uh, uh, that is adding to costs? Is there, is there a role that those three knives in that block uh, actually perform in the sense of making the system work better? I'll, put the, I'll try to put it in pers perspective. There's 3.7 million indices, but as Simon was talking about exchange-traded funds, globally there's between 7,500 and 8,000 of those globally. So as Simon was saying, clearly the vast majority of these indices are used for benchmarking purposes. Um, and a lot of those we would never, you, would, you and I couldn't come up on a chalkboard and come up with most of them. Because most of them are purely used as benchmarks for institutional investors. And to add one thing to Simon is, said is, in the institutional world this is very important of what benchmark they use because a lot of times that's what their managers are paid off of. To, and it's another way to see are they truly adding value to your investments. So there's this whole benchmarking side that we don't normally think about as investors, 
that are behind the scenes that are really driving whether we get superior returns and we invest in funds or not. Okay, now if we look at all of those indices, they clearly extend across the range of financial assets. Uh, some of those financial assets and the indices attached to them we see very frequently and we're probably very familiar with. So for example, uh, the Dow Jones, the S&P 500, we're talking about stocks. We probably less frequently look at indices with respect to bonds. But can you give us some perspective looking across those different financial assets, at the asset types. How well developed are the indices, the family of, uh, of indices for different types of assets? And what does that imply for the investing public, for the markets, and so forth? Well, um, one thing to realize is they're not just uh, indices for stocks or bonds. Um, when you think about some of the innovations that have taken place, uh, you as, we as retail investors couldn't invest, for example, in commodities or currencies. Uh, those have all been uh, because of indexes have been created. So it really, you, whatever you can think of, you can create an index for. And a lot of that does get turned into products that directly benefit us as, as investors. And one thing to also think about in, this, in that context is we as kind of retail investors are, are just the tip of the iceberg. One thing that the indices have allowed us to do is get to some of those same products the institutions have been able to invest in for 20 or 30 years. So that's been one of the innovations that I think Simon's referring to. Yeah, and I would just say, when I looked at the industry, I think a lot of the exciting work is going on in the, the fixed income space, actually. That, I mean, um, in, particularly in the field of uh, ESG, uh, a lot of... Uh, the, the, the Chinese debt market, for instance, if you that that's now accessible, emerging market debt, again things that you would never have access to, you know, in the absence of these products. And just to put uh, some numbers to that, I mean, the fastest grow the fastest growing area of growth in our last survey in the equity space was in ESG, which is environmental, social, and government governance issues. So people are starting to change the way they think about investing and what they want their money to do. Um, so that's been the fast-growing area. The other uh, really fast-growing area has been in fixed income, as, as Simon was saying. And we have the data to, to show all this as well. Now, when you think about the growth in the number and extent of uh, financial indexes that are available, um, can you see that as, in effect, a uh, if-we-build-it-they-will-come kind of thing? That, that there is a, a logical progression to the creation of these, these indexes, or is there a kind of a demand pull where the market is asking for information <coughs> and the industry responds to that? What, what's your sense of what the motive force is? I, I think <coughs> it's both, uh, to answer that question. Uh, there are indices that um, a lot of our members create uh, based on a lot of research that they do, a lot of analysis they do. Um, you can kind of think of those as kind of, you know, leaders or thought starters, greenfield type things like, you know, thought that Charles Dow said, <coughs> thought there was a need for an index in the 1890s is kind of crazy that we think about it. Well, it's obvious. Well, it wasn't. Um, so a lot of it does come from research and analysis by um, the members. The other, but probably the vast majority of it now actually comes from clients saying, you know, we need this index minus this, or have you ever thought about incorporating factors into your models to create indices? Or as uh, Simon alluded to in Smart Beta, can you think of indices that you can develop that try to outperform the market? Um, so I, a lot, it does come from both sources. Okay. Um. There was one episode, historically, um, where I think many people kind of raised their eyebrows and paid attention, and that was the London Interbank Offered Rate uh, Index, which raised some questions, uh, and there were, there were clearly objections to the way that index was created. Um, 
Can you explain what that problem was and how has the industry tried to, to respond to that kind of problem? I mean, I think it gets at the heart of why the IIA exists. Um, things like LIBOR that are price assessments, um, people that calculate those type of price assessments actually can't be members of the IIA because we make a big distinction of to be a member, to do best practices, you need to separate those functions out. So when you hear about is your index that you're investing in independent, that generally means that that company does not trade the underlying component securities of that index, nor do they create the product that's sold to you. So there's three levels of checks and balances along the way. You know, things like LIBOR, things like, uh, there's some other instances in history. Um, what happens is there's, you know, can be some inherent conflicts of interest if you're selling products and creating the index yourself, or if you're trading and creating the index yourself. LIBOR just happened to be a, a, a situation where they're involved, the people are involved in all three pieces of that business. But if you go back, and the reason why we think it's so important is if you go back and look at independent indices, there's not been a problem with any of them dating back to the very first one in 1895. So we think it's uh, you know, even more than just a good practice. We, we, we think if everyone would adopt that model, uh, investors would stay out of a lot of the headache that they, that they incurred with LIBOR. So in terms of, of safeguards, one of them is the, the issue of independence uh, up between the index and the application of that index in a financial product. Are there any other uh, practices that you believe are extremely important for the working of the industry to make sure that the independence is both real and perceived? I think there's a, two things that are important is, one is if you're truly an independent index provider, um, you, don't, you want the best available data to come into your index. Because as an independent provider, you're really not motivated where the market goes up or down. You're trying to provide the best representation of whatever market or segment of the market that you're trying to measure. Um, you know, the conflicts are there on the independence piece. But it really gets down to the heart of why are you creating the index. And you know, if your goal is to best measure something and you don't have, uh, as, as we would say, a dog in the hunt, um, you have a whole, lot, whole much better level of objectivity in just creating the underlying basis of it. Yeah, I, I think you know, when I was talking to some of the, 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 the fund providers, you know, I, it depends on the motivations for wanting to do it themselves. I mean, obviously, if you, have a, if you develop a fund that uses a, an index from S&P, for instance, S&P Global, you, you pay S&P Global a, a licensing fee. Um, now, one way to reduce your costs is to do that yourself and not pay S&P Global a licensing fee. And, you know, that, that's when I think, you know, just it, trying to cost avoid becomes <laughs> slightly uh, questionable. Okay. Now, one of, the, um, one of the complications in constructing an index is the world changes. Uh, you can maintain an index over a period of time, but Simon, you were discussing earlier on that a particular <laughs> financial <laughs> instrument that is a part of an index might cease to exist, might fall below, say, the S&P 500 lower threshold, uh, and beyond that, as the values of instruments change over time, at some point, presumably, you need to rebalance the index, as it were. So uh, clearly, that's got to be an important part of the behavior of indices, and it's going to affect how people perceive the workings of the market, how the market is performing. Um, what do people need to understand about how those indices are changed? When you've got a, several indices that represent the same piece of the market, to what extent is that kind of methodological distinction going to be one of the differences among those overlapping indices? And, and what does all of that mean for those of us who invest in uh, uh, index funds? Yeah, when, so when I said that exchange traded funds are, are simpler. It doesn't necessarily mean they're simple in, in the sense that you could, don't 
sort of, uh, there's still work to be done. Uh, and the thing about ETFs and, and index funds is they're very transparent. They're very, here, is, here is the methodology that we use. Here is the index we use. And, and then it's up to the individual to, to decide whether that is the investing experience that they want, I think. And, and so I mentioned a couple examples in the report. Uh, lots of emerging market index funds out there. But they're, when they're based on different index providers, that can lead to very different experiences. So I think I say in one of them, uh, one large index provider calls South Korea an emerging market. Another index provider thinks, no, South Korea is a developed market. You want, it, you want exposure to the South Korean market? Don't go with the one that calls South Korea a, 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 a developed market economy. So, you know, the information is out there for, you, for, for, the, for the investing public. Um, but you've got to actually take responsibility for it yourself, I think. Yeah, it, and that's one of the big messages from IIA is, you know, the, this world has given a gift to all investors and in that it's the transparency is out there. It really is one of our, one of our uh, main objectives is to tell people it's out there. Take a few minutes to figure out what's in the index, how it's going to perform, how, how things are going to come in in the index, how they even categorize. Like I said, Simon did a great job in this paper talk, bringing out some of these issues. It really is out there for you to figure out, you know, what you want to be invested in. You know, unlike a lot of the active funds, you may just, you know, invest in a growth fund. Well, that, that could mean anything to anyone. Here you actually have the information. Please take the time to uh, do your due diligence and figure out what you're investing because the at the fund level, they start marketing these things. They all sound like the same thing at the end of the day. Um, so do your due diligence is, is uh, the big thing that we tell people. Okay, let's try to sum up a lot of what we've seen here. Um, where is the index industry going in the future? What are the new horizons? What are the, uh, the aspects of the financial markets that perhaps we could represent better? How can we better serve the investing public? What kind of information is available to assess the performance of money managers going forward that you know, we need to develop further? What, what's the horizon and what's the what does the future look like? Um, I'll, I'll take a stab at it first. Uh, I, and I think we've talked about a couple of these concepts. The, the place where we see a lot of research going on and a lot of the regulation, uh, especially coming out of Europe, uh, is really in this ESG area. Um, I think there's two couple of big things going on and some demographic shifts going on uh, as the baby boomers retire and we all pass and, and donate our money to our children or, or to our charities. Um, you know, younger people have a different viewpoint on what they want their capital to do. Um, you hear a lot about impact investing now. You hear a lot about, you know, we want companies to, to represent our values. Um, you know, in one sense, for the industry, that provides a lot of data challenges because some of that data is just not recorded the same way. Like, you know, what does low carbon mean to a company in the U.S. versus low carbon in, for example, France? And then also in the EU, what does low carbon mean to Slovakia? It means completely different things. So things, we, we need to get better data to, um, I think, really escalate that movement to um, ESG. Uh, I think the other area uh, is what Simon mentioned, is I think fixed income is going to see probably some profound changes um, post-financial crisis. Um, I think a lot of the way the underlying market is, the transactions are recorded are getting more transparent. Um, bottom line is where there's better input data, there's better indices out there to represent markets. And I think that only continues I think some of the big data projects, believe it or not, will get wound into this industry to, to help with some of that because, you know, if you look back on it, you know, the reason why the Dow Jones index is calculated the way it was was people did it by hand. You know, now with the computing power we have now, there's all sorts of ways you can slice and dice the markets and come up with better reportings, come up with better indices. Uh, I think the challenges to the second half of that, uh, I think the challenges are how do we educate the marketplace? 
how do we also regulate the space properly. Um, IAA is actually in favor, has been in favor of the regulation that's come out um, because a lot of that is bringing up some of the lesser players in the market and I think that's needed. Um, and I think um, what we need to do, make sure that they, regulation has, the unintended consequence I think would be unfortunate is if it becomes so expensive that you have massive consolidation in the industry. I think those numbers look even different from what Simon showed earlier. Um, so I think there's a, a number of things we need to think about, but I think, uh, you know, especially in the, in the area of fixed income and ESG, the number of indexes, fortunately, unfortunately, will just continue to expand over time. And one last thing, if I can add on ESG, and I think the reason why the number of indices continues is, you know, we may have 15 factors that we think are important as, you know, our, our kind of our social issues or our mores, our values. But if we agree on 14 of them and one of them's different, we're going to have to create another index. So, you know, hopefully 10 years down the road, the way this uh, industry develops is people will start scoring companies and then we can get, you know, take it, you know, in a, in a manufacturing standpoint, we can get mass customization to come in and people will say, I want companies that score 90% on every, you know, every measure that I have or 95% or 85, whatever that threshold. And then I think people will, will uh, make, it'll become easier for people to invest that way than having us all having a unique set of uh, products or companies that we don't agree in because, you know, exclusion is a tough way to get to uh, an, an industry to move forward. We need to make it more inclusive. And I think the Europeans are, uh, quite frankly, years ahead of us uh, here in the US on that. Okay, one last crucial question. Is it indexes or indices? <laughs> Is it Himalayas or Himalayas? It's whatever you want it to be. 